meet on the most misunderstood word in the English language. <laughs> Doesn't that get you thinking? No, it has nothing to do with procreation. <laughs> <clears throat> the word is stewardship. <laughs> oh boy. And uh, so here we are in the first, uh, the second Sunday of 2017. I remember when I was a teenager and I thought, oh my word, I'll never live to see the year 2000. And now here we are, uh, 2017. Stewardship is the most misunderstood word in the English language. And um, if you ask most people what stewardship means, they will say giving or money or tithing. Uh, but stewardship, according to Webster's Dictionary, listen to this. Stewardship is the responsibility of managing the assets of someone else. Wow. Stewardship is the responsibility of managing the assets of someone else. So stewardship is managing something that isn't your own. And the word steward means manager. So why should we start the year with an emphasis on stewardship. Um, well, for one reason, do you realize <clears throat> that it is the second greatest theme in all of the Bible? Do you know that? It is taught from Genesis to Revelation, and Jesus talked more about stewardship than he did about heaven or hell or prayer. Did you know that? It's true. To really understand stewardship, we have to go back to the beginning of Genesis 1. And so, I, I, I mean, I'm really going to go back to the beginning. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 <laughs> says, In the beginning, God created the heaven, the heavens and the earth. So the first principle about stewardship is this. God owns everything. <laughs> he does. And so why, why would uh, I claim that, that God owns everything? Well, number one, he created it. And number two, he sustains it and upholds it according to Colossians uh, the, that's the book that we're studying in our uh, life group. And uh, Colossians says that he holds everything together. He keeps the planets in line. And he owns it because he made it and because he sustains it. At the end of the fifth day of creation, uh, verse 25 says this, God saw that it was good. Now, compare that with verse 31 in the same chapter. At the end of the sixth day, God said, it is very good. Wow. So what happened that would cause God to say, it is not just good, it is very good. What happened between verse 25 and verse 31? That's the big question. And you probably know what it is. Man was created. Woman was created. God looked at the earth at the end of verse 25 and said, I did a good job, but there's something lacking. And he made man, and he made woman. Why did God make man and make woman? Why did he make us? Well, what was his purpose? 
And I think the Bible uh, teaches us that he made man to be the caretaker of this great earth, the world, to be the manager, the steward of all the resources that God has created. Then in Genesis 1, 28, God said, be fruitful and multiply and increase and, repl- and, and fill the earth. Wow. Uh, the birds do that. The fish do that. The animals do that. And might I add, <clears throat> that's the only command that man has ever been able to really keep well. And <laughs> obviously man has has kept it, but I I remember I said earlier in the year, I look at all those children leave and I say, you guys are doing a fabulous job. (laughs) Fabulous job of being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth. But then God says, I'm making man a little bit different not just like the animals, not just like the birds to to fill the earth. But I want man, I want him to do five things. And, uh, And these five things will lead us to conclude that God wants us to be stewards of everything that he made and everything that he owns. Verse 28 says, God said, fill the earth, number one. Subdue the earth, number two. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over all the creatures that move on the ground. And then the last two are found in Genesis 2, 15. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. Wow. <clears throat> so the second principle is that God created man and woman to be the managers of his creation. Principle number one. Wonder what that apple's for? <laughs> Principle number one, God owns it all. Principle number two, you and I were made to manage what God owns. Oh, one of the things he made is water. (laughs) Man's basic problem, one of his basic problems is that we forget our purpose. We go out and we we start managing and pretty soon we're thinking that we own it. I mean, we try to trade places with God. We start using words like my and mine. That is cute. (laughs) My life, my plans, my possessions, my time. And my question is this, who gave it all to us? God did. And stewardship, when you get right down to it, is simply partnership with God. And if we can really grasp that concept, that God made it all and put us here to manage it, it will revolutionize our lives. You say, Wow, that sounds good, but specifically, what are we to manage? Well, we are to be a steward of absolutely everything. I want to put it this way. It's like God made this great earth. And then he said to us, here, I give it to you, the trees all kinds of fruit and the animals and the fish and the birds for food, deep aquifers of clean, 
pure water. I hope this is pure. <laughs> Lakes and oceans, coal reserves under the ground, wind, sun, and seeds of every kind. And gr not only that, but great caverns and stores of oil and gold and silver. And I've created everything you need in life, everything, and I give it to you, mankind, to tend and to care for it and to use it. Isn't that beautiful? That, and that is the truth. And that's what stewardship is about. Stewardship of absolutely everything that is God has entrusted us with. Everything. Did God give us an environment? Yes, he did, and it's beautiful. And so stewardship involves ecology and care for the earth. Did God give us a physical body? Yes, he did. So stewardship involves physical fitness and nutrition. Did God give us every single day of our lives? Yes, he did. Then stewardship involves time management. Did God give us wealth? Oh man, he poured it on us in America. Material possessions. Then stewardship involves money management, financial planning. Did God give you positions of authority, a place of prominence, maybe where you work? Then, then God says stewardship for you involves using your influence for good. Did God give you a new life in Christ? Yes, he did. He created us. And when the devil took us away, he found a way to buy us back. He sent his son in a way we as believers are doubly owned by God. And so he gave, if he gave us a new life, then stewardship involves the responsibility of sharing your faith with other people. So, what about tithing and giving? Really, all that is, all tithing is, and all giving is, is a reminder. The tithe is 10%, and when we give 10% of our income, it's a reminder that all has come from him in the first place. And God doesn't own the 10% of our income. He owns it all. He just lets us live on 90%. That's a way to look at it. The 10% is a reminder that it all came from God. And God is saying, I just want you to remember, and I never want you to forget that if it weren't for me, you wouldn't have anything. And that's stewardship. You might say, well, my ideas, God, I beg to differ, my ideas got me where I am today. My creativity, everything I have in my life is because I worked hard for it. I'm a self-made man. Listen, the self-made man usually worships his maker. And that's pretty scary. Listen, if God took his hand of blessing off our lives, where would we be? I think sometimes... We don't understand that. And I don't ever want to know where I would be if God took his hand of blessing off my life. Who gave me and you that ability to work, to produce and create? God did. Who gave you your creativity? God did. And God just says, I want you never to forget that I'm the source 
I am the creator. There's a church in the south uh, that was growing so fast it ran out of parking space. And uh, they went across the street to a supermarket that was closed on Sundays. It kind of sounds like a match made in heaven, doesn't it? And they made a deal with the owner to use the, par the supermarket parking place. Uh, and the owner said, you can use the parking lot 51 Sundays out of the year. But on the 52nd Sunday, I'm going to chain it off. And the people said, why? Why would you allow us to use it for 51 days of the year, 51 weeks, and then on the 52nd, you chain it off? And the grocery store manager, owner said, because I never want you to forget the parking lot belongs to the grocery store, not the church. And that's why what tithing is all about. God said, I never want you to forget where it all came from. I'm the source of all of your blessings. And really, God owns it all. This is not a trivial matter. It is the, a basic principle in life that's found in Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, in the first part of verse 18, says this, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hand has produced this wealth for me. Uh, then lis listen to the last part of verse number 18. But remember the Lord your God for it is he that gives you the ability to produce wealth. Isn't that an amazing portion of scripture that explains so much of what's going on? God has blessed us so much. And I think he gets pleasure out of watching you do a good job of managing his resources. God thinking, I'm the owner, but you're responsible to me. Remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Wow. Deuteronomy 14.22 is talking about tithing. Tithing is the concept. And God says <clears throat> of giving the first 10% of all the profits of your income back to him. Oh, Malachi has a lot to say about that too. But he says in Deuteronomy 14, 22, be sure to set aside a tenth of all your fields to produce each year. Why? Why? Verse, the last part of verse 23. <clears throat> so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. And I think when we get this right in our mind, that God owns it all, that I manage and I give, I bring those first fruits into God, I think it helps us learn to revere the Lord God always. And I think that's the purpose of tithing. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 23, 23, which I had on my phone in the King James Version, and I forgot my phone. So, but I think I have it memorized. Jesus said to the Pharisees, woe, in Matthew 23, 23, woe unto you, Pharisees and scribes and rulers, uh, for you tithe on the small things of the anise and, and mint and cumin, but you have neglected the weightier matters of life, justice and 
I've forgotten the other one. <laughs> mercy. Faithful, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And then this would have been the time for Jesus to say, ah, tithing is Old Testament fooey on it. Jesus said, this ought ye have done, but not neglected the former justice and mercy. And what? Faithfulness. Woohoo! Aren't those great? So, why do we start the year off talking about stewardship? Because I don't want you to waste the year. God says, as a manager, you're held responsible for making the most of your life. Now, listen, let me tell you a story, then my testimony. Uh, regarding tithing, and then I want to talk about this apple. And uh, I didn't have my wife type the story or the testimony into my sermon notes. And Pastor Jim and Beth have said that half the fun of a, of a church service is watching my wife's face <laughs> when I go off script. <laughs> Keep an eye on that, babe. <laughs> First of all, I heard this story. I would say 40 years ago, and I don't believe I've ever used it, but I have never forgotten it. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to think of the, the last time I preached on tithing, you know, when I would only preach a couple times a year two, three, four times a year, I had all kinds of exciting subjects. I think I go back to my years when I was a senior pastor in Redwood Falls. I started in 1977 and ended in 1986. And I have no idea what I preached about tithing, but I'm giving you a double barrel here because this is my, my, the next shot I had at it. And uh, it's... It's actually kind of um, exciting to preach about this because uh, in our Wednesday night prayer, the men, the, the men in that Wednesday night prayer meeting touch my heart. And one of the things they were praying for is to break the cycle of lack in this church over the years. And uh, so... Let me tell you this story, give you a testimony, and talk about this apple. There was a farmer who lived on a ranch in a beautiful valley. One day, a young couple came to his door and asked if they could rent his place just up the road in that beautiful valley. He said, yes, I think I could do that. I don't need a whole lot of rent money for that. So they settled on a price that he felt was very fair for them. And they moved in that fall. And they moved on to the farmer's property. A beautiful trout stream ran through it. Acres and acres of woods. A cute little farmhouse. A barn with a horse cor a corral. And a beautiful big strawberry patch that the farmer had planted himself. Then the first month came, the rent, and there was no rent money to the farmer. The second month came, and there was no rent money to the farmer. The third month came, no rent money to the farmer. Fourth, the same. Fifth, the same. Sixth, the same. Seventh, month the same, no rent money to the farmer. Then one day in the spring, the young man shows up at the farmer's door with a big container of luscious looking strawberries. How do you suppose the farmer felt about their gift? Remember, 
The farmer planted it. The farmer owned the patch. I don't think the farmer was too pleased with that young man on that day. Now, erase what I said about no rent. Let's suppose, now suppose, that they had faithfully paid their rent all during the fall and all during the winter. And he brought the rent money to that, uh, on that beautiful spring day uh, to the farmer. And he brought along with it a big container of luscious looking strawberries. I think that would bring a smile to the, to the farmer's face. And I want you to know that our faithfulness is noticed by God. And I think it brings a smile to his face. Now, let me share my testimony. My brother recently said to me, uh, you know, they say that we should have saved 10% for retirement and uh, all our lives. And then he asked me, he, he sort of lowered his glasses and looked at me and asked me this question. Do you tithe? That's really what got me thinking about a lot of this. And uh, the implication was that we should be socking money away for ourselves and not tithing. And believe me, that was the implication. And I thought back on my life since 1968. I have tithed. I feel in some ways I'm kind of at the end now. And it's a good feeling to look back and say that I have tithed. All those years. As a minister, I tithe to the district. Did you know that they keep track? <laughs> did, you, did you know that I used to be a presbyter? And, uh, and if there's somebody who's behind, I have to go to them. I had to go to them and ask them what their circumstances were. They keep track. <laughs> so about 25 years ago, I told the bookkeeper to, to uh, keep the tithe out on every penny of our income and send it in to the district because if I don't see it, I am never going to be tempted. And uh, then we have always pledged uh, money to missions, tried to in increase that. You, as, as often and as we can, as much as we can. Then there's what I would call almsgiving to specific needs. People who are in need. I think, like Pastor Michelle talked about, I think this is something that we as a church will pray about and God will move on us as individuals. And over the years, we gave significant amounts of money in almsgiving. And at the end, uh, sort of toward the end of your ministry, it's a good feeling to say, I've been faithful. I, there were three churches that I, that I was a, a pastor in where I could have taken welfare if I wanted to. <laughs> and, uh, but we never did. Um, God always provided. If I would have taken welfare, I, I would have robbed God of an opportunity to show his blessing to me. And God always provided. David said, I was young, now I am old, and I have never seen the righteous begging bread. So I, I thought of the provisions of God over the years, and I think there were tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. <clears throat> and I, I can't even begin that, but let me highlight just a few. When I was in Owatonna, I came on staff, and the previous uh, pa youth pastor 
worked uh, part-time and got $10 a week. And so I came uh, and I was going to put 100% of the time into the, the church youth group. And, but I, and so they gave me $10 a week. And that is 40, maybe 40 to $45 a month. And my rent was $75. Gas. I had to eat on my own. And uh, I, I remember Sister Hodak came up to me one day and she said, Pastor Bruce, I want to ask you something. I, I won't do this if you say no, but I, I want to pay for six months, start out by just paying for six months of your rent. And I said, oh, that would be okay, Sister Hodak. <laughs> then Bill came to me and he said, I know you're, you're going to get engaged because I, I don't think I told them before I told my wife. <laughs> They knew I was getting engaged, and he said, I know you can't afford a ring. And he said, I want to tell you that I went and bought a ring that I think is not garish, um, but he said, I think it's a, it's a beautiful diamond. And if you would accept that, you could give that to your wife. And I said, I accept that. <laughs> so... I told my wife we were thrilled about it, and then one day I joked to my best friend. I said, I, I don't know if she's engaged to me or Bill. <laughs> oh, I went a little too far there. <laughs> so then we, we moved in ministry to uh, Redwood Falls, and uh, have you ever heard of a prolapsed uterus? I still honestly don't know what it is. But we had a farmer in church. Every time one of his animals would have a prolapsed uterus, they would butcher and they would pack our freezer. They got us a big freezer and they would pack it full. And they did that for nine years. And he said, and another, the same farmer said, if you ever want to come out, uh, you know, just drive out. I'll change your oil. Don't worry about anything. And, and, just all kinds of ways. There was a multimillionaire who came into the church under our ministry there and, and uh, said, I want to buy you a new car. And I turned him down. <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't want to be beholden to anyone. And, and once I worked that, that out, my presbyter said, are you nuts? <laughs> and uh, I did work it out. And I went down and picked out a brand new car. And he never ever was asking for anything in return. And I could tell you blessings. Rochester put 5% into our MBA over the years, um, 5% of our income, and they did that for 30 years. Wow, do you know how much money that equals at the, at the end? You know, some people by a lot of standards would say, well, that's not enough. And, or whatever, but boy, I thank God. I think, I think that we should do that for our pastor and uh, who, whoever he's going to be. And then there was my aunt who never had children. And when she died, left us her beautiful little lake home on Shano Lake and, and everything in her bank. And I was able to, the, the, uh, my, the lawyer that, that she had put this all through said, you know, you can have every penny of this. And I said, no, I would like to give my brothers and sisters some. And he said, you know, you don't have to do this. You could, and he just went on and on with all the stuff I could get with it. And I said, no, I want to give the lake home to my sisters. And I want to give a, a chunk of money to my brother, a, a nice big chunk, and, and I said, we paid off our mortgage and, and all our bills, and that's how we were really able to retire. And I just want to say that God watches out for his own, and you can never, someone said once, you can never 
outgive God. And uh, I just, I just want to say God cares for his own. Now let me talk about this apple. For those of you who have never seen it, it, it will illustrate everything that I've been teaching. And uh, I, I hope that it helps change your life. This apple represents my paycheck. And I'll include yours in this. This is your paycheck right here. And uh, so the first thing that, you know, what, what all comes out of that? Well, what is the biggest chunk that comes out of it? Mortgage. That's not a big enough bite. <laughs> Back in the 50s and 60s, 60s, my mom had a, my mom and dad had a house and their payment was $103. There's the mortgage, mortgage payment. <laughs> and uh, that's big. I'm sorry, I'm going to pig out in front of you. <laughs> So, what are other things? Rent, um, if you don't have a mortgage, boy, you know, that's a big chunk. <coughs> then there's electricity and water. Garbage, that doesn't come cheap. <laughs> oh, that's an evil laugh. <laughs> Then there are the bills. I hope you don't have credit cards, but sometimes that gets big. Then there's groceries. Do you know I I really enjoy eating? Not this fast, but <laughs> <laughs> And then there's insurance. Oh, <laughs> Can't wait to listen back to this one, huh? This is coming. <laughs> There's insurance on house, cars. We just got insurance with a new company, and they ask, what kind of insurance do you want? They ask, do you want earthquake insurance? And I remember years ago, they said there's a fault line that runs from... <laughs> North of Minneapolis down to St. Louis. <laughs> it's only 70 bucks a year, but I got earthquake insurance. <laughs> That's a little bite. <laughs> and then there are taxes. Oofta! <laughs> I don't care who the governor is, he just keeps asking for taxes. Gas. I'm glad it's down, you know, to two dollars and some cents a gallon, but that's a big bite. Lawnmower. Stinking snowblower. And then there's the dentist. Nobody has dental insurance anymore as we just found out when my wife went to the dentist. Oofta! <laughs> and then there's prescriptions. I got one little tube that they drop in my, they put one drop in my eye three times a day, $113 for that little sucker. <laughs> and I left the biggest for last. This is my wife's hobby that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Buying for the grandkids. <laughs> Some of you are raising kids. My, you've got braces. You got a kid playing hockey? That ain't cheap. 
and I'm probably forgetting a lot of things. <laughs> clothes, oh yeah, I forget clothes. My mother used to give me clothes for 40, 30 or 40 years. Now I have to buy it. <laughs> so, here's the deal. We get our check, we pay our bills, we come to church. Randy comes up, one of our elders, standing in front of you and says, we're gonna take the offering. And you say, oh no. And you pull out your offering envelope and then you pull out by now the brown and maybe kind of sour chewed up apple core and you think, how can I get this brown, chewed up apple core into the offering envelope? And, we, and then, then we say, here God, this is yours. And how, how sometimes do we think that makes God feel? Remember, everything you have belongs to God. <laughs> why, why would God, why wouldn't you give God the first bite of the apple before that big stinking mortgage bite goes out <laughs> or whatever. And so we would like to challenge you to give to God the first bite of the apple. I'm, I'm doing this sermon because we prayed among the men that we would break the cycle of lack at this church. And... Um, I, I, Randy started telling you, but I talked to Pastor Jim bis, just before we got a printout. Excuse me, I'm going to burp in a second here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, before, before uh, as, as far back as Pastor Jim could remember, we got a, we got a report from Greg and... Uh, we ended the year in the black for the first time since Pastor Jim could remember. And not only that, but missions. Our mission started this last year well in the red. In fact, we had to defer our missionaries to half payments. And now the missions is coming in so good that we have a surplus and we're paying that all back, what, what we owed them in half. And so... I just, want to, I just want to challenge you to give God the first bite, not the brown, sour, chewed up part of our apple. And so I would challenge you to do that for three months. And uh, if the mortgage company says to you at the end of your three months, if they call up because you're falling behind and you can't pay your bills, Come and talk to me. <laughs> Come and talk to Pastor Jim. We won't say a word to anybody. We'll refund the entire three months back, back to you with no questions asked. So we actually believe that if you give God 10% first, that God, the 90% will not only go further than 100% would have gone but God watches out for his own. There went a piece of apple. <laughs> so we, uh, we will celebrate our family Christmas today, rescheduled from December 10th when I was sick. Oh, so thankful I'm feeling better. The grand, I'm still not quite there, but the grandkids are coming over at 1215 I hate to preach on tithing and run. It's <laughs> bad. But if you have any questions or complaints, talk to Pastor Jim. <laughs> Let's stand together. Uh, the elders will be here. If anybody wants to pray, they would be thrilled to pray with you. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your amazing care in our lives. We could never outgive God. 
And I pray that today we will understand the importance of giving that first bite of the apple to God. I pray that we will understand the concept that really we are managers, we are stewards, and that God owns it all. And Lord, will you change our lives? And God, I specifically pray for the last thing that oh, a, that you will break the cycle of lack in this church. God, that you will break the cycle of lack in this church. And so, God, it's all about obedience. Bless your people. Walk with us through everything in our future. You know what our future holds. And you know, when we are faithful, how you will plan to bless our socks off. Oh God, bless your people today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.